Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast, presented by Strategic Treasurer, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. Live at the 2019 AFP Conference in Boston, host Craig Jeffrey sits down with special guest Jennifer Stanley, MUFG's VP and Senior Product Manager of Real-Time Payments, and Mark McCarthy, Managing Director of Energy and Power Transaction Banking, to discuss real-time payments, learning from the customer. Listen in as they explore this brand new payment rail and the transformative value it's bringing to business to consumer applications with a focus on the utility industry. Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast. This is Craig Jeffrey. I'm here with Mark McCarthy and Jennifer Stanley from MUFG. We are at the AFP conference in Boston, and today's topic is real time payments, learning from the customer. Welcome to the podcast, Jennifer and Mark. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm glad you guys are here and we're able to catch up. Mark is the head of Energy and Power Treasury Services at the bank, and Jennifer is the product manager of real-time payments and wires, and she's been on the Treasury Update podcast before. But as we get into this topic of real-time payments and, and looking at the, the customer, learning from the customer, and what's changing, I think, Jennifer, why don't you start us off for those that may want a, a refresher or need to learn about RTP. What is What are real-time payments? What does that mean? I think the most important thing to stress about RTP is that it's not derivative of any other payment type. It's a brand new payment rail. While it has aspects of wire and ACH, it does not run on those rails, and it's completely new. It's available 24-7, 365. It's rich in data carriage capabilities, uh, it uses ISO 20022, which is the new standard for payments and soon will be the standard for wire payments as well. But it really is the forefront in this area of, of uh, bringing this data standard to payments. And so ISO 20022 is usually or exclusively implemented with XML format, the extensible markup language. That's correct. I think it's important to know, like on the wires, like you said, that's going to go away. So there's, you know, Adopting that type of format is important, but for real-time payments, so it's sitting on new rails. It's available around the clock, 24-7, 365, as you said. Is this more analogous to ACH or analogous to wires? And it's totally different. So how would you how would you describe it to someone to say, here's this thing on a new this new payment process on a different set of rails? Well, one of the important things about RTP is that it, the payments are made through irrevocable credits. So it's similar to a wire in that respect. But it's also similar to an ACH in that it's, it's much cheaper. It moves not in batch form as an ACH does, but it is in a one-off push through of payments. Generally, what are the applications of real-time payments that you are seeing? Obviously, there can be multiple. What are you seeing as the best pickup of it? We've seen a lot of interesting areas, and probably this happened in all markets around the world that have adopted real-time payments, is that consumers pick it up most quickly. We have seen the success of Venmo and Zelle, which are quasi-real-time payments, not real-time payments per se, though. But consumers are using that a lot to pay their friends, to uh, receive payments from companies, and to receive money on an instantaneous basis straight into their account. So like you said, biggest pickup to consumers, and then, uh, but there, it can be a corporate application. Absolutely. And I think as you move up the ladder to corporate applications, the value of real-time payments and the data that comes with the payment itself, it really becomes much richer and much more rewarding to the whole payment value chain. So I guess I could ask, why don't they call it real-time and more data payments? But I won't ask that question on the podcast. But thanks for that background. So Jennifer and Mark, I'm not sure who would want to answer this question, but you took a very thoughtful approach at looking and focusing on what the applications would be of this and looking at some customers. How did you observe your customer base and figure out what to do? And maybe you could also talk about what you did do to you know, come up with these use cases to explore and uh, gain benefits in RTP. Yeah, I think it might be helpful if, if Jennifer uh, sets up a little bit about how we identified the industries that we decided to focus on as we looked to develop the RTP product. Jennifer mentioned RTP is a new payment type. It's a rail. It's a method by which 
funds are transmitted and, and data carries with it. But as I've said, and Jennifer's heard me many times say, that's not a product. So we had to identify what is it that, that companies, our clients, are, are going to find value in in the application of this new rail, right? What pain points does it solve? What customer experience for their customers can it improve? We didn't necessarily know those things. We had some ideas, um, and that's kind of what gave us direction in the approach that we took. And so, you know, maybe Jennifer, you 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 came to me and said, "Hey, I think utilities will be a good fit for this uh, approach." But I know we worked with some other industries as well, so you were kind of in the forefront of of making that decision. So, so why did you think utilities was a, a good fit, or the other industries? Well, I was looking primarily at business to consumer applications, and obviously, in the utility sector, you have a large number of consumers who use utilities and who are paying by a variety of different methods currently. And as a result, the, the utility company has a number of pain points in processing all those payments. And RTP eliminates a lot of those pain points, particularly on the speed of the payment, the data that's reconciled along with the payment, and with the whole experience of working with the consumer paying the money into the, the uh, utility's bank account. I know you just said some of these things where you talked about some of the pain points. Speed was an issue, so this eliminates some of that, how quickly it is. You also talked about the amount of data that could come across. Why is that important to a utility? Obviously, you gave examples of Zelle or Venmo. It's like you owe a person. It's for babysitting or whatever. You transfer it. You type a little message in there, and it goes to them, or they just know because there's only one payment. What's different in the, you know, the industries that you talked about, insurance, utility? Well, there are masses of consumers, and you have to reconcile those payments with who's paid. And those payments need to be reconciled not only to the accounts payable system or accounts receivable system, but also to the customer portals, which updates the accounts and says the customer has paid and their account is is good again. You know, as you went through and you you identified these industries, so that was your hypothesis you wanted to look at. Those organizations that had a lot of consumer activity, a lot of complexity, a huge amount of volume, if you picked insurance and uh, utilities, what is unique on utilities or insurance beyond that? How would those two differ, for example? Well, one reason we wanted to look at utilities is that as a, a sector, they work very closely together because they actually are not competing with each other. They're heavily regulated. They usually operate in their own geography. So we knew that it would be good to bring in, talk to, understand their pain points and their friction points in their payment processes and try to solve for them through RTP. So you were able to bring in multiple utility companies at once because there was no no issue. Okay. And did you do the same thing on the insurance side? Uh, In the case of insurance, we've been working one-off with insurance companies. Okay, one by one, right, because of some of the different concerns. So I think our discussion today was really learning from the customers, particularly focused on the, uh, the utility industry. I think that's where we wanted to turn most of the discussion. But there, there may be some other things you want to share on the insurance side. So how did you go about getting them together? What was the process you used? How did you go about learning from them and, and test your hypotheses? Yeah, I think the first thing that we did is we had a lot of internal discussions because before I I was comfortable with taking the approach of asking our clients to, you know, spend a good amount of time with us um, and let us learn from them. I really wanted to make sure that we had a valid hypothesis around RTP. And some of the things that I had been hearing from clients is we just don't see how this is going to uh, improve anything for us and and you know getting our money uh, faster in the utility industry when when it's a you know a bill due date necessarily isn't something that uh, is is uh, a major concern for us so there was a lot of discussion internally and sort of one-off discussions I would have with clients around their initial perceptions and assumptions of what the value of RTP would be. So it took us probably three months of that sort of discussion before I was comfortable with saying, okay, let's, let's go out a little bit more broadly. So we, we held a webinar. We had about 25 utilities show up to that webinar. We sort of did an introductory discussion around RTP and then did some polling 
within that webinar. From that, we then followed up. I think one of our poll questions was, would you be interested in working with us on an innovation lab session where we did sort of a deep dive around these things? So we had some people raise their hand, several different utilities across the U.S. And so we started with that group and actually had a one-off session with, with a big utility in California in the innovation lab and shared those results and brought in a few more on the East Coast. And then we did a second one in New York as well. So overall, I think we had about a total uh, 10 separate utilities within the innovation lab sessions. Um, and then, like I said, we had about 25 to, to 30 that attended a, a couple of webinars that we did over the year. If I were to pretend to be someone who might have given you some feedback on like why well, RTP shouldn't matter for that industry, uh, I'll just say a few things and maybe you can shoot them down in terms of what you learned. It's like uh, we already have ACH. That payment rail exists. It's a, it's a standard flow. There's existing rules. Uh, it's very inexpensive. And you can collect tomorrow information or even same day ACH sometime, but you can do it so that the, the money or funds move with the settlement date of tomorrow. Why is there an importance to add something else so that it goes one day faster? And then if you say something about the information, I'm going to say, well, we can run that through the portal so we know where it's going to apply. So it seems like, okay, this it's a new shiny object. Why would we put that through a new untested rail. Yeah, that's one of the early thoughts and, and maybe objections that, that we heard early on. I think that what we learned was there are specific applications. If immediately it seems that people go directly to paying a utility payment, right? Well, so utilities have anywhere from five to eight different payment channels across their payment ecosystem. Okay, so yeah, why would I want to add another one? The easy answer to that is because consumers are going to demand it. And they're going to have in other applications, in Amazon, the way that they pay, that, that, that consumer experience bleeds over in, into the utility market. I expect more options. Yeah. I want to pay on the very last day and originate on the last day, for example, as opposed to a day before or have it set up automatically. I want to control it, but hold on to my money another day. Is that a possible reason? Uh, yeah. I mean, as, as a consumer myself, I'm not sure that I want to use RTP to pay my utility bill, right? Okay. I, but um, I might want to float that cash another day in my bank and let the batch settlement process over time, you know, uh, benefit from that. But I think what we're seeing in e-commerce in particular, you know, you're starting to see the concept of micropayments and, you know, the vast volumes of payments. I go on to Amazon today and, and I buy multiple things that are under 20 bucks, right? So you're seeing a huge volume of payments through the, the different rails. Card settlement is, is a huge one, right? But um, I just think, Craig, that the easy answer is that consumer demand and the way that they're used to paying will drive a lot of that adoption. But what we learned is that there are other applications beyond just paying a utility bill. So when you start looking at the payment flows within the organization, like we did in the innovation lab sessions, you start seeing, okay, there's refunds, there's rebate payments that utilities make. So disbursements going out, right? And there's last minute payments that you have a at time of shutoff that, you know, being able to validate that payment and for the utility to actually have the cash. But there, there's segments of utility customers that know how the system works, right? And so they know that they can come in, pay the bill, avoid the shutoff or get the power turned back on cash may or may not be there but the utility doesn't know that until the reconciliation process happens a few days later or how however, however long that takes oh, okay so a, a clear application would be as it approaches shut off or turn back on the finality of settlement is or irrevocability of settlement removes it treats it like a wire with the cost of an ach oh, okay jennifer did you have anything to to add to that the other thing I would say about an ACH in that case is that it is revocable, and so it is not as attractive as an RTP. But another place we looked at, um, as Mark mentioned, the rebates or the um, refunds. There's an incredible problem with escheatment when these rebates and refund checks aren't cashed. That leads to a, a further 
friction in the payment process because these checks that are cashed have to be escheated. They have to be tracked down at the end of the year. Long process with it. With RTP, you know the payment has gone straight into the person's account and he has it. Yeah, and escheatment is that uh, terrible process that uh, is predicated on the assumption that the company, if they can't find where the payment goes, that the payment is not cleared or the check is not cashed, that it needs to be left with the state, typically the state, so that uh, they'll hold it for them and eventually they'll come and collect it. And so there's a whole reporting overhead, massive headache. That alone is... <laughs> That alone, when you think about the volumes, the number of returns, refunds, rebates that come out and the, you know, they get stuck in a drawer, now create a, a whole economy of activities to support this achievement process. So. Yeah, and when you think about the cost of, of that payment type, uh, what we found is the majority of utilities in the U.S. issue checks for those refunds and rebates. Some of them use prepaid cards, but the vast majority issue checks a lot of these payments are under a dollar. So when you start to think about that whole process and include the achievement cost within that process, you're talking about issuing a payment at a negative return, a, a, a seriously negative return. You know, uh, payments under a dollar that are costing you, you know, 30 to $100 when you include the whole, the whole process. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. And then I, I guess we, we started talking about the innovation labs before I got a sidetracked about why. Why would you use RTP? Um, but on the innovation lab side, you were you were going through this process of trying to discover what was important for their experience, for their operating expenses, for efficiency, cost. How many utilities were involved again, and what did you learn through that process? What what were you gaining insight on in terms of use cases, activities? Um, we we have a pretty good understanding of utilities payment channels and how they they collect from customers across those payment channels. Obviously, that's a a major focus of utility companies. Uh, They spend a lot of time, you know, in how that process works, how efficient is it, what's it costing, but they also spend a ton of time thinking about the customer experience. And really, in in the current landscape in in the utility industry and, and going forward, as you continue to see alternative energy sources, continued to see deregulated markets, a different retail model. The utility industry has changed vastly in 20 years, 30 years from being a monopolistic type of industry where customers used to be referred to as rate payers. They weren't customers. They paid the bill. They paid the rate that that was set, right? And so that mindset has completely shifted. And they, they view themselves as consumer product company, right? And so they're, they're, they're competing in many um, service territories. They're competing against different, different retailers and different types of options that customers have. So the customer experience was a big piece of this and how, you know, that interaction, that B2C transaction and the experience of that for the consumer, you know, um, there's functionality within the RTP rail for something called a request for payment, right? And so that ability to get a request for payment from the utility or the consumer to the utility for a refund or a rebate through an app on your phone with immediate settlement back to you, that's something that plays along that consumer experience side of, of things, right? There were other aspects that, that we were interested in as well whether, when it came to the B2B side, when it came to the disbursement side of the equation that we really wanted to dig deeper into. We felt like there was probably some application for some B2B payments around areas where utilities have field payments, situations where maybe a utility truck backed into a, you know, somebody's fence and they got to, they want to make settlement on that. Or, you know, there's various, various things that came out through that angle. And, you know, we had ideas about it and, and it was great to hear from the clients. Yeah, that's kind of close to how that works, but here's how it really works. And we really get to understand it and get to understand the details behind it. A lot of that goes to the data that's associated with, with real-time payments as well. So, we dug into to a lot of those areas. Jennifer, is there anything else on that side that you wanted to? Sure, I'll just add that we spoke to a variety of people from these utilities. I mean, we spoke to corporate treasurers, we spoke to 
payment strategists, we spoke to customer service people, and the perspectives they brought to bear when discussing the various pain points in their processes was very interesting. Um, you know, there was a lot of agreement, but then you, you got different aspects of, of what they were looking at that, that really pointed to different and uh, useful information. So as you completed the Innovation Labs work with these 10 utilities, what were the results, the top results that you'd want to share? We identified some very good use cases, very compelling uh, and very implementable use cases that could be employed immediately out of the gate. Uh, one I can think of right offhand was collections in the field for delinquent payments. And I think Mark referred to this, you know, often when they're collecting the field, they're handed a check, which is then going to bounce. They're then going to ride out uh, free utilities for another two weeks while that check is resolved. And then they may bounce another check. With real-time payments, you get certainty of the payment being delivered straight into the account, and that solves that problem. Oh, very good. Yeah, that sounds... <laughs> handling the, one of the biggest headaches and issues that exist and, and, and financial risk, too. Is there another uh, use case, too? Yeah, I'd say that, that one of the biggest issues and, and conversation topics that we had uh, through throughout this process was integration and implementation and the impacts to, you know, client ERPs, customer billing systems. So we had some sort of a separate parallel track working with the treasury folks and technology folks in the utility sector and then with our side on the on the technology side and and built a business readiness guide that really walks through all of the impacts all the key stakeholders that you need to be um, socializing the coming of real-time payments right in within the organization so from a treasury perspective as a business partner and advisor within the organization, having that business readiness guide and leading the way within the organization to, to sort of bring together all of those stakeholders is really important. I think, you know, that we talk a lot with our clients about how, how do you more effectively influence the organization and, and advise them. That's a big role of what Treasury does. So we wanted to make sure that, that we, we provided those tools to our clients. And, and I, I feel really good about how that, that business readiness guide turned out. How is that impacting other industries, for example, that whether it's business to consumer or even business to business payments? Any, any insights there? Yeah, I, I, well, I'll just speak to, I also cover the oil and gas sector. And so there, there was some crossover in um, some of the scenarios from the utility side, particularly as it relates to kind of in the field payments. Some of the things that oil and gas clients struggle with, issue a lot of checks for, are right away payments. Utilities also have this situation in many cases. Uh, lease payments, land payments, oil and gas companies make. So, you know, as RTP first rolls out at, at $25,000 transaction limit, there's there's some challenges around the B2B space, but I think as it grows and that limit comes up, and I think it's already set to go up to $100,000, you, you'll see those applications. And so I think, you know, there's there's some characteristics around transaction types that lend itself well to RTP. Just from my point of view in the energy and power space, we're starting to talk about, okay, how does this relate over on the oil and gas side? I guess as we draw to a conclusion on this episode, what uh, what, what is your advice to others who are looking to use real-time payments, figure out a use case, maybe in another industry? What should they be doing or thinking? And I'll start with you, Jennifer. Sure. Well, I think the most important step is education. I mean, a lot of people don't understand what real-time payments are. And that's why I started this session with explaining that it's not like ACH and like, like WIRE. It's its own new thing. And I think that's one of the most important things you have to do when selling it up the chain. Um, and what we did with our corporate readiness guide that Mark alluded to really is setting that stage for education and how it may be applied and used most effectively within the organization. Thank you, Jennifer. Mark, any, uh, anything you want to add to that? No, I think Jennifer's exactly right. I, I think, you know, as you you listen to what we just talked about, there's a lot of different pieces to RTP. Yeah, it's a new payment rail. 
and as Jennifer mentioned, it's, it's different from wire and ACH. I mentioned request for pay. There's a communication layer within RTP. So being educated on this stuff is really important. It's, it's not just, hey, the payment's going to be faster. There's a lot more into it. And um, if Treasury wants to be viewed within the organization as, as, as somebody that's value add, you need to, to know this stuff because it's, it's coming. You know, the, the RTP train is on the new rails and it's moving. Um, I do think it's going to take time. It's, it's not a two-year, three-year sort of adoption rate. It's, this is, we've seen it in other countries, you know, over the course of 10 years, I think, is, is how this is going to move. Obviously, with the, the corporate clients that we work with, a lot of the interest is going to be a little bit more towards the B2B side of things in, in my space. You know, lots of wholesale type of payments. So I think the other thing to, to leave people with is be realistic and be patient. And at the same time, don't dismiss it because it's, it's for real and it's here and it's coming and there are benefits to it. I think, I think you guys are given a fascinating story about how you approached a new, a new payment type um, with a whole set of different features addressed it in the industry. And I'm, I, I am glad they call it real-time payments, not real-time payments with additional information, a messaging <laughs> layer and finality. I think that's, uh, that's just good to know. And so I really appreciate you guys sharing that with the audience and, and congratulations on stepping through these and coming up with some real use cases that are making a difference. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Craig. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.